some viewers may find the following video disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. Hey everyone, welcome back to Board Games Unlocked, and today I'm going to be doing a ranking over all 16 units in War Chest. This is going to be, like I said, over just the base game and the units that come in it. And mainly this is just a fun video. Everyone likes rankings, right? So, uh, I have basically done a complete 180 on, yeah, 180 on War Chest, because the first a uh, couple times that I had played it, I was like, this isn't that good, uh, but I really want it to be. And then I gave it another shot knowing what I knew, like from having previously played it, and then completely flipped on it. And I have been playing it a ton since then. So uh, I thought it would be fun to just kind of go over the, each uh, unit and talk about my least favorite to my most favorite. And this kind of comes with a caveat because I actually don't think that any unit that comes in the base game is, like, inherently bad. Like, <clears throat> this game, uh, in my experience, seems so well balanced that uh, it's either that the, the ones that are at the bottom are either that I'm not using them all that well and the ones that are at the top that end up being my favorites are the ones that I seem to use really well. So this is definitely a ranking on, it's a subjective ranking, like every ranking list ever. So uh, yeah, I think that a lot of units or every single unit, if it's uh, like, can be, you know, improved if it's paired with another unit. Cause if you're not aware, War Chest is a game where you shuffle or draft, but basic game is you shuffle the 16 cards and deal four out to uh, both players and then it's the player's jobs to figure out your best synergy between your four and what your opponent can do and what counters you have for each other and uh, dealing with the randomness of the bag anyway with that all out of the way with that preamble out let's go ahead and start with my number 16 and my number 16 is one that i have basically not been able to utilize that well at all and this could be i'm very curious to know how people use this one so my number 16 is the lancer so to me the lancer is the the unit that is the most restrictive. So first of all, it comes with four units and its ability is that it can move one or two spaces and then attack all in a straight line. So, and it can only attack using this tactic. So as it's showing on the card, if it's going to attack a unit, uh, let's say this was the case, to attack the scout, it could move one and then attack it. And I mean, if it was like this, this, the Lancer could move two and then attack it. Okay, well that's not horrible. But a lot of the situations that I find myself in are this or this to where it ha since it has to attack in a straight line, uh, you can't move and then attack this way. Uh, based off the diagram picture, it has to keep attacking basically in the direction that it's moving because it's a Lancer. So I find myself in this position a lot. And every time that I have the Lancer on my side, I'm not able to make them work well. They're always the odd group out. Uh, now, again, they every unit poses a threat. So the Lancer being like, if you can pop them out like here, whenever there's other units to where you can do it, you are gonna force your opponent to move the units out of the way. But because it also has to move to attack, units coming up like that, since it can't move to you know one or two spaces, it can't attack. So I find myself at odds every single time I have the Lancer, I have had them many, many times and it just it's rough it's rough i mean maybe because there's four units maybe they just become a unit that you bolster three times and you just use them once and you just kind of try and position them and they're always going to kind of be in the way i don't know it's it's a little bit too restrictive and to me they're the most restrictive unit out of the base game so that is my number 16 the lancer my number 15, let me just double check. Yep. My number 15, and honestly, this was a very difficult 
uh, ranking, honestly. Like, I I knew what my number 16 was going to be. I knew it was going to be the Lancer. But then as I started looking, I, was, I could justify a lot of where things could be. And it, it got really hard towards the top. So, my number 15 is, you know, actually a, still a really good unit. But its ability eventually goes away. So, my number 15 is the Mercenary. So, the Mercenary, there are five of them. Which is, I mean... I, th I believe the most out of all of them. There's uh, there's like no units that are six. But the mercenary, uh, his ability is after you recruit a mercenary, you may maneuver your mercenary unit. And that's pretty good because a maneuver is a move, control, attack. Uh, and so, like, if you have, like, all four, and let's say you have a mercenary out on the board... You can recruit a mercenary and then have it do something. You could have it move. You could have it uh, control. You could have it attack. And that's good, but then you eventually run out of mercenary units to recruit. And like the Lancer, I haven't been able to utilize the mercenaries all that well, although I have seen them used better than I have. Uh, to me, the mercenaries feel like if you can get a like one or a, like maybe two like a bolstered mercenary out in kind of the middle to where it has a lot more options and you wait to actually recruit them then uh you have a lot more versatility like if you kind of can get them like if you can recruit and then move the mercenary where it's uh surrounded by like other units then that could be very beneficial hell I mean, you can also play Interrupt, where if you have a mercenary that is kind of in position against, like, the Lancer, for example, and it's your turn, and you recruit a mercenary, then you can actually move them to where the Lancer can't attack. So you can kind of do some really tricky things with them. Uh, so I do like them a lot, uh, but to me, because as the game goes on, you're going to have them all recruited. So if you weren't optimal with each recruit of them then you basically have units that don't have an ability, whereas your opponent most likely has four units that have abilities. So that is my number 15, the Mercenary. And again, I still think they're good. I still think the Lancers are good. I think I just suck with them. So um, I'm, I'm very, very curious, because I'm late to the party on this, so I'm very curious to see what people think and how, uh, like, what everyone's personal rankings are. So my number 14... And, again, like the Mercenary, my number 14 uh, is good, but it's just kind of boring, honestly. So my number 14 is the Swordsman. So the Swordsman has five units, and it's a very basic ability. After it attacks, it can move. And, gotta be completely honest, that's good. Like, if you can get them out in... Uh, I'm gonna keep using previous ones as an example... But if, let's say, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, let's say that you have a swordsman there and you're, you can be attacked by a lancer, the fact that you could activate them and attack like a mercenary and then move out of the way, I think that's super solid because, again, normally to do an attack or a move, those are two separate actions. So to have them double up, a lot of factions that can double up on actions like get a two for one with one ship then that's extremely versatile in my opinion and the swordsman has that but they're here at the bottom mainly because they're just boring like i don't find them super exciting uh the fact that they have five chips is still really good because if you can get like again a nice bolstered unit that you're able to okay i'm gonna attack with uh, one and then attack the mercenary and then move up and then hey I have another one still to attack and then you can start maneuvering around getting rid of opponent chips as well as getting into position to be able to take a control for the next time you activate them is very very good but that's all they do like they only attack and then they move that's 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 it so based off this kind of fell at the bottom mainly because I like the other ones a lot more. I think they're a lot more creative. But like I said at the very beginning of this ranking, I think that 
every unit has a uh, really good potential, especially if you're, because you, I mean, it's not just one unit. If you only had swordsmen, that'd be super lame. But because you have three other units you can synergize with, then they could be really good. So that is my number 14, the swordsmen. My number 13, and this one actually kind of surprised me because I have seen them used really well, and I've also used them really well. They are super good. But because they're similar to another one that comes with the uh, the base set, they're a little bit more restrictive, so I actually put them down here. So my number 13 is the Crossbowmen. And good, you can see these. So the Crossbowmen, again, there are five of them, so that is better. But they have a tactic that is attack a unit two spaces away in a straight line. The intervening space cannot be occupied by a unit. So, like that, the crossbowman can attack the lancer. That's good. But if the uh, if that happens to be the case, then they don't have a shot, uh, at least towards the lancer. But as I found out, um, the crossbowman isn't restricted to uh, not being able to attack adjacent units. So you can activate the crossbowmen to have them attack adjacent units. That makes them still good because if they were as restricted as like the Lancer was where they could only attack two spaces away in a straight line, then that would be, I'd, they'd probably be down at the bottom with the Lancer. So the fact that, okay, I have the capability to shoot two spaces away as long as it's in a straight line, uh, that gives you some some options, but if let's say if the Lancer moves out of that shot Then it's like okay. That's not the end of the world I can still activate them to attack something adjacent to me which Gives them that flexibility, but again kind of compared to Others that are going to be later on, you know shocker. It's a ranking list. So you eventually options, you know dwindle out it is it's still not as, as versatile as I would personally, personally, personally like. So, but there are five units of them that can still be uh, really good. So that is my number 13. Yeah, I think it's my number 13. So 16, 15, 14, 13. Yep, number 13, the crossbowmen. My number 12. Uh, and like I said, this this got really, really difficult. Like. About, yeah, about four units in, I was like, well, the rest of these are all amazing. Uh, so I really had to kind of like think on how, <laughs> like, how efficient they are. And this one, I, I feel like this one's going to be a lot higher on other people's uh, rankings if there's ever been a ranking of War Chest. Uh, but my number 12 is the Ensign. I know. I know, the Ensign is really, really good. Comes with five, and the Ensign's ability is choose a friendly unit within two spaces uh, of the Ensign. The chosen unit performs a normal move to a space within two spaces of the Ensign. So, basically, if there is a unit that is within two spaces of it, it can have it perform a normal move not move it within two spaces of it like it can't like jump it like over there um it just hey you're within two spaces of me i can have you do a move as long as it's still within two spaces of the ensign the reason why i put the ensign at this low is because if it doesn't have units adjacent to it then it basically does nothing so that was my only justification other than that the fact that it can move and give other uh units of its on its side more movement which is huge because the whole point is to be able to control these areas uh is insane and i think the ensign makes a lot of other factions better hell as the lancer if you have a unit that is you know out of the range uh or out of the straight shot of the to use the lancer's ability but there's an ensign well okay if i can act if i have an ensign and a lancer in my hand okay i'm going to activate the ensign to do his tactic to move the lancer in its uh 
now it actually gives the Lancer way more flexibility that you don't have to use its own token to get it in position. The Ensign can make it go in its position. In this case, you hope that the your opponent doesn't have a crossbowman uh, to activate to just shoot it. But if it doesn't, then it's like, oh, haha, now I can use my uh, Lancer token to actually use its ability and attack. Again, the Ensign is very, very good, and it can be, honestly, the game changer for uh, who who ends up having it. But if you're able to start dwindling, like, let's say it's pairing up with a really good unit, if you kind of take its unit away from it, then you uh, then it basically does nothing. Or, because it's so good that you're gonna your opponent might try to actually target them so if you're really relying on its ability and it gets taken away from you then you've kind of shot yourself in the foot because your whole strategy relied on that so it's kind of like what it, like that glass cannon kind of mentality where it's like hey i'm really i do a lot of damage but i also can die in one hit Kind of a similar analogy here where the end sign, it's like, hey, I'm going to be super beneficial on my team. I'm going to be an amazing support. Oh, you killed all my units, so now I can't do anything. Um, which is a good thing that shows it's a good unit. Like I said, it started to get really difficult, and then it kind of went into more personal <laughs> personal taste. But, yeah, the end sign is super solid. So that is my number 12. 16, 15, 14, 13, 12. Yeah. Number 12, the end sign. Number 11. Yep, that's, I, I knew that was coming. Uh, so if you know the end sign, then you basically probably can guess what's coming up next. So my number 11 is the Marshall, which is basically the end sign, but for the opposite, uh, or for the other effect where Choosing a friendly unit that is within two spaces of the marshal, the chosen unit attacks if able. So, like the uh, like the end sign, if the uh, if the marshal is within two spaces of its unit, let's say it's paired up with the crossbowman, it's like okay, I'm going to activate the marshal to have my crossbowman perform an attack. Again, being able to get double. Uh, use of your tokens is huge. Like the end sign, it's like, hey, now I don't have to use my own, I don't have to use the crossbowman's token to move. I can now use it to attack. It's vice versa. Hey, I don't have to use the crossbowman's uh, token to attack. I can now use it to move. So it's like, okay, gonna activate the marshal. Crossbowman's gonna attack, kill the mercenary, and now I can, on my next turn, I can actually move the crossbowman in a better position to attack another one. Uh, I basically, I mean, I, come on, I had to put them together. They have essentially the same ability. They, for just for movement or attacking. Now, I have never actually had the luck because I have never done the drafting. I've always done the random because I just like that. My old house rule, I haven't done this in a hot minute, but my old house rule was everyone gets random factions. Everyone gets random characters, everyone gets random something just because I like the idea of getting something random and making the best of what you can do with it. And I really like that about War Chest because it's exciting to see what four you're going to get and how you're going to utilize them. So I haven't gotten lucky enough to get the Marshal and the Ensign together. And I think on paper that sounds really good, but I feel like it might not because you only get three tokens uh, each each round. So if you happen to draw the ensign and the uh, and the marshal, like you only have one other token that you basically get. A, I mean, no, that still would be good because you use the ensign to move that one unit, and then you use the marshal to attack, and then. If you have another way to attack, you can use that unit's token to move or attack. So never mind, that would probably be super good. But yeah, the Marshal, again, not having to use a faction's token to attack, just like the Ensign, you don't have to use it to move, is very, very solid. But I think the same kind of reasoning is with this as with the Ensign. You're gonna probably try and get rid of the Marshal, so then if there's no units within two spaces, it doesn't do anything. Granted, that doesn't mean it doesn't, like, it can't move or attack on its own. It could just easily move to get in position of two spaces, but I don't know. I don't know. 
I, I have seen games where the Ensign and the Marshal haven't haven't been doing really a lot. And that could be for a variety of things. It could be the, the players weren't using... Uh, that wasn't the part of their strategy. It could be that they weren't getting drawn from the bag at optimal moments. That's part of the game. But the uh, that's where the Marshal is. So, those are the ones outside of the top 10. Yeah, so 16 Lancer, 15 Mercenary, 14... Swordsman, 13 Crossbowmen, 12 Ensign, and 11 Marshals. Now we're going to jump into the top 10. And my number 10 is the Scout. Which you might think this should be really low. But I, for a game that's about positioning and area control, and where a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, uh, units don't have a lot of ways to kind of naturally interrupt. The scout is one of the best to do that. Since this is a game so heavily reliant on positioning, because it's kind of it has a lot of chess-like elements. Since this is a game about positioning, and like I've talked about with the crossbowmen or the um, or the lancer or a bunch of other factions that I haven't talked about yet, the fact that the scout can be deployed adjacent to any friendly unit can be huge. If you don't have a scout on the board and you almost never want to, in my opinion, you never want to bolster the scout, you kind of want to play them as annoyances or interrupts. Like again, let's say your opponent has the ensign and they use their ensign ability to uh, move the lancer in, uh, in position to be able to um, have them come and attack your unit. Okay, well, you have a scout in your hand, and it's like, oh, okay, so that was your move. Okay, boom, going to pop the scout right down adjacent to that, so now it's interrupted. That has been used so much in my uh, experience with the scout that it's super annoying. Because one, the scout just kind of shows up, and it's like, okay, well, now I can't attack. The lancer has to either be moved back or anything like that, but... Since there's five scouts, if I pop it down and I happen to have another one or another one coming that's in my bag, well now my scout can attack the ensign or the lancer. So it get, you kind of get a two for one combo. One, you interrupt your opponent's plans. You also don't even have to do that for an interrupt. You can uh, use that for a little bit more control. If you have a unit that is kind of able to move you can kind of divide and conquer and have your scout pop down here and then start moving your units to take control of another area. So when you draw your scout again, you can have your scout control and not even have to worry about you moving another unit onto it. I just really, I mean, this kind of has a feeling because I used to play Magic the Gathering a lot. It kind of has that small element of, uh, you know, aha, or I, I gotcha uh, moment that m a lot of these factions don't have. Because the scout can pop up adjacent to any friendly unit, you have a lot more ways to kind of disrupt your opponent's plans versus really a lot of the the factions that are in this uh, in this base set. So that's really why the scout is at number ten. I just kind of really like that sneaky tactic, and because you're almost never gonna bolster them, then they're probably gonna die. Like, you're eventually going to lose them, uh, and I'm not really taking that into consideration uh, for abilities, because it's like, well, I mean, if you lose all units but one, then yeah, no one has an ability. Uh, actually, except a few. But, like, the fact that you can kind of just have a scout pop in, maybe get a quick control, like move it there, and then you have two in your hand, so you pop the scout down. They don't have an answer for it, then you spend the other one to actually take control over that. And then, yeah, my, it's probably going to die next round. But you have other friendly units somewhere else, and you start planning for that. You start moving... Um, I'm trying to find another. You start moving another unit elsewhere so that you can have another scout pop down and then take control over that, and it's probably going to die. I, I just think that's a lot of fun. So my number 10 is... Got a scout! Then we move on to my number nine, which is 
the Footmen. One of the only factions in the game that breaks a core rule of the game. And that core rule that core rule is that you cannot have multiple units deployed uh, individually. Otherwise, the scout would be way higher. If you could just pop multiple scouts all over the place, it would be disgusting. But you can't. You can only ever have one unit like that on the board. If you want to put another one out, you bolster that one to make it harder to remove its presence. However, the footmen can. Two footmen units may be deployed at a time. So you can have multiple footmen units. They can even be double bolstered. That's disgusting. Uh, and their tactic is you get to perform one maneuver with each footman unit on the board. And again, maneuvers are control, they're attack, and they are movement. So that is disgusting. I mean, hell, you can even do this. Have a really tanky footman unit, and then one that's just kind of in the background. So you have this one be the forefront and have the other one kind of up on its rear guard. So if you happen to have, I'm just going to keep picking on the Lancer. If you happen to have an activation, then you can play the footman, have that one attack, and then have this one control. That is disgusting. Um, and I feel like they're actually, they might be one of the more complex units to actually play because you now have to take into consideration where they're both at um, to get your biggest bang for your buck like you don't want to just kind of have two units out on there and then all you're doing is just kind of maneuvering and you're not doing that or you have one over here and one over there and then you play a token and you kind of just move them i mean so that's really good and if you happen to have another one on your turn you make them both control i feel like the footman can kind of be that very last ditch clutch where you have to get two like you have one control token left to place and then your opponent takes one back giving you two but then you've strategically placed two footmen and it's like okay boom i'm gonna have them both control and you win i feel like that can happen very if you're not paying attention to where they're both at so not only do you have to keep track of where of what they're both doing your opponent has to keep track of where they're both at and hell even if they take out one like if the lancer happens to take out this one well you still have this one over here that you get to still activate versus Oh, okay, well, you killed my only footman that's on the board. Now I have to basically wait to get them redeployed. So, like basically every other faction, you kill, like, their only presence on the board. It's like, yeah, I have three more in my bag. They're going to come back out, but now I have to try and get them repositioned where I want them if I wasn't able to get further control of the area. The footmen are just super interesting in that way, so that's why they are at my number nine. My number eight. Yeah. Okay, so like I said, between literally all of these, like, the footman was kind of like, okay, this feels about right. My number eight and higher uh, was so difficult to place because... My number eight has been a pain in my ass since I started actually replaying this game. But there is a counter for it, hence why there is kind of, a, it, it did go down to eight. So my number eight is the Pikeman. So, Pikeman has four units. Its ability is when the Pikeman is attacked by an adjacent unit, remove a coin from that unit. Basically, it has retaliate. If you have a Pikeman and most units have to attack adjacent. There are literally two that do not <laughs> have to attack adjacent. Um, then they're, they're basically trading. Like if you're having a scout pop down, like they basically have an amazing defense because you put one down, that's gonna deter your opponent from wanting to attack them because if the scout attacks, yeah, it kills my pikeman, but it also kills uh, it kills your scout. And because it says remove a coin from that unit, uh, my understanding is that that coin also dies. If it said discard, like, if it's like, okay, you know, that the you know you attacked my pikeman, and if that made this just get discarded to your opponent's um, discard pile, I don't think these would be that good. But the fact that it says remove, it's we're trading. So 
anywhere the pikemen are they're just an annoyance wherever they're at you you pop them somewhere and it's like great okay yeah i mean you're probably not attacking with the pikemen but you you can there's no you have no reason not to attack with your pikemen but then your opponent wants to retaliate and they have to make that decision if they, if they want to make that trade or not and i find that insufferable the pikemen are essentially the only unit well, sorry not the only unit but basically one of the f one or two units that are good with one token left because every time if you're down to one token for most units the only thing you can really hope to do is just kind of put them on a control spot that you obviously control and it's defense it's it's a uh, okay you're gonna have to spend an action to kill it um and that might buy me some time. The pikemen have that same effect, except that now I'm flank. I'm forcing you to either okay, yeah, it's gonna play defense, and if you don't have an, uh, a better way to go out and get a uh, get a control point, if that's the one you were trying to take, well now the pikemen is gonna okay, yeah, you can take it. It's my only token of the pikemen left, but. You're going to have a unit die too, so pick which one you want. Again, most units don't have that. If you're down to one Lancer, and it's like, okay, I'm going to summon it. That's all it's ever going to do. It's right there. Which, again, is one of my least favorite aspects of, of War Chest. When you have one unit or one token left, and that's all it can do. Anyway, uh, the Pikemen just are, are great for that. In fact, if you are wanting to be more aggressive with them you just force the pikemen up have them in a like a in a uh, like a line coming on and it's like okay now they're in the way again like they're gonna attack me do i just try and get rid of them and the fact i almost feel like that most of the numbers that each of the units has i don't really have a problem with like i think some might be good with like maybe one more like, it's like, okay, like, I feel, feel like the Lancers, they only have four. I feel like they should have five. Um, and maybe another one might have six. The Pikemen are the ones that I think they should have three. But I understand why they don't, because then they would be very, very uh, limited. So four does fit, but I hate fighting against them. So that is my number eight. Yep, that is my number eight, the Pikemen. My number seven is a very basic one, honestly, but the fact that it gets a two for one ability, uh, kind of similar to the Swordsman, but in reverse, I actually, I think this is done just a little bit better, and that is the Cavalry. So the Cavalry, there are four units, so unlike the Swordsman who have five the cavalry only have four but they can move and then attack and i feel like that's a little bit more uh digestible of a strategy instead of having to get your swordsman into position to attack and then move them out of the way uh the cavalry basically have that flexibility to kind of look at the battlefield and determine where they want to go so a lot of units aren't uh kind of aren't safe like some units are, are safe with one uh like one space away but with the cavalry they just become very disruptive very disgusting when you have you know a unit and let's say that's controlled by my, like me popping the cavalry down makes that immediately threatening because it's like no most of the time you'd have to spend a token to move them in position and then spend another token to attack. But the fact that the cavalry can move in and just start annihilating, decimating your opponent's forces is super, super good. There are only four of them, but if you had any more, that would be disgusting, I think. So, yeah, they have always been a good... In fact, one game um, that I did have, I think, what did I had? The... Well, I'll talk about it later, but the i just think the cat i mean yeah again they're basic they're basic and they're simple just moving and then attacking 
but I feel like you're able to kind of pop them on control points that you that you have, and you're able to kind of start using them immediately versus getting the swordsman out and then okay now I'm gonna have them attack and then move. Still good, but the cavalry's just better. I mean, come on, it's the cavalry, not soldiers or swordsmen. And also one thing I, I wanted to bring up with the pikemen because I was talking about how. Uh, disgusting they were the reason why they're actually not higher is because it specifically says attacked by an adjacent unit so anything uh with range uh now you might not have any range and the pikemen are just going to be completely disgusting but if you have you know the crossbowmen for example then the P pikemen's ability is is hard cancelled like there's not a lot of units in the game that are hard cancelled by something and the pikemen can be by another unit which again you you might not have and if you don't have any range then yeah you just have to eat that eat that shit but that's why i kind of had to pick them and put them at eight but the cavalry doesn't have anything like that they get to pop in and then use a tactic to move to move and then attack and then oh man i'm just gonna do that again i'm gonna move and then attack and then i'm gonna move and then attack so you can just get got a lot of a lot of kills with the cavalry which can just be disgusting. As soon as, every time I play against the cavalry, as soon as one of them pops in, I'm like, shit. I am immediately in position for them to attack me. Maybe I'm lucky and they didn't get another cavalry uh, token. Uh, and I can try and get rid of it before it gets to do anything. Um, I feel that every, every single time. So that is my number seven, the cavalry. Five, four, three, two, one. Yes, my number seven. My number six. Yep, yep. My number six is kind of up here. Uh, as I started to get higher and higher towards my number one, it became more about like how much efficiency can you get with the least amount, you know? So my number six is the Berserker. One of the more complex uh, units in the game, I feel. And because they also, also, I think, have the most text on them. The Berserker... There are five of them. They, after the Berserker maneuvers, which again is move, control, or attacks, uh, you may maneuver it again by discarding a bolstered coin from the Berserker unit. You may do this multiple times, but you may not remove the final coin. This is one of the very, very few factions that actually does something with bolstering. Normally you're bolstering just to keep your units on the board, and there are some other factions that are great with bolsters and more defense. But the fact that the Berserker uh, gets to do something with them and gets to potentially move a shit ton of times, you know, attack uh, multiple times. I mean, if you have like a four bolstered Berserker unit and you can activate them with one token and you can, okay, that's going to move. That's a normal activation. I'm going to discard it to have it move again. I'm going to discard this to control this area. I'm going to discard this to attack, to attack a... Uh, to attack a unit that's insanity now you have to be able to be kind of allowed to bolster i feel like the berserkers are hard targeted that they can be really disgusting if you kind of get them out at the very beginning and you recruit all the units and you just have them sit in the back and then if you have like an ensign or something that allows you to start moving the, the berserkers until you get them into a juicy position to have them do basically four activations in one turn that is disgusting but i've also never been in a position that anyone's allowed me to do that uh i mean hell though even just two bolsters that makes it to where they're gonna be like still hard to kill that it's like okay they're not limited to only being able to do stuff when they're bolstered so if someone tries to wipe them out and they kill one unit it's like okay well i can still activate with them i just can't do their ability so it's not like they're hard limited and the uh, other wording on here is the fact that it says discard a bolstered unit to me that means it goes onto your discard pile versus like the um the pikemen where it says remove a coin from the attacking unit that means to me removes from the game with the berserker if i'm activating them and i'm able to do like 
one thing where it's like, okay, I'm activating them, gonna move him there, gonna discard this, so this now goes into my discard pile to attack, kill that, discard this to attack, kill that, and then discard this to have it now move onto that control point. Uh, and I still haven't lost these actual tokens is nuts, which is thematic to the Berserker. Um, yeah, now, again, if that is misworded or incorrect and you actually are supposed to remove these from the game, then these go these guys go way down. But the fact that it says discarded makes it sound like it goes into your discard pile, and that's how I've been playing them. Uh, so, yeah, they, they just become an immediate threat, and because they're the immediate threat and you're bolstering them, that means people are focused on them and not your other units, and if they start... Focusing on your other units, then your Berserkers are getting stronger to where they're going to get... Now, I don't think you're going to get like a bunch of those massive turns, but you might get a few. A few double actions with one one coin, and I think, again, action efficiency with one coin is huge. That's why I like the Cavalry. It was also high up, because it's one coin, lets me move and attack. Swordsman's the same way, but I've already talked about that. Anyway, so that is my number... My number six, the Berserker. Now, to recap, as we get into the top five units, my number 16 was the Lancer, my number 15, Mercenary, 14, Swordsman, 13, Crossbowman, uh, 12, Ensign, 11, Marshal, 10, Scout, 9, Footman, 8, Pikeman, 7, Cavalry, 6, Berserker, and the top five units in war chest in my opinion my number five is the superior bowman the archer uh this get this unit has one less than the crossbowman hell it even has a detriment to it it's the archer can only attack by using its tactic but its tactic is so good that it's it's just that's why it's this much higher than the crossbowman. Like, so its attack, its tactic is attack a unit two spaces away. The intervening space may be occupied by a unit. So, what this means is that if there's a unit two spaces away, it does not have to be in a straight line. You can activate it and it can go one two. It doesn't have to position itself to be a straight shot. And hell, there can even be a unit in the way. There can be multiple units in the way. It can actually shoot over. But what makes it difficult, and this is why the archer is not higher, is it is not able to attack the units adjacent to it. So the archer can be uh, can be countered, but I can only think of one unit that can counter it uh, pretty efficiently. But the fact that other most units are going to have to try and get up adjacent to it before it can even attack it, you're most likely going to be able to move your archer out of the way. And if you have a very fine bag, like last time I actually played, I had a very, you know, thin bag that it was basically my archery units that I was drawing consistently. So I almost always had two archers where it's like, okay, you got it close to me. I'm going to move them, move them back. Okay. But now it's my turn. Now I'm going to shoot. It's like, oh, you moved up close to me. Okay. Well, in my hand, I have two of these. So I'm going to spend one of them, move it back. And then if you can't activate those guys on my next turn, I'm going to take out probably the cavalry. <laughs> but yeah, they. I just think that their detriment, because the crossbowmen are allowed to attack. If they're here, um, they can activate and attack things adjacent to them. They wouldn't be able to attack the scout, but they're not hindered by being able to, um, oh, you got adjacent to me? Shit, I can't, I can't attack you now. Uh, which can be a problem for the archer, but I really think that there's a reason why there's four of them and not five, because their ability is that much better, being able to shoot over units and not have it be in a straight line. I just had a way easier time with archers than I have with with the crossbowmen. Now, I've played against games where my opponent has had both, and that's ass. I think I had a game where it was, they had two archers, um, the ensign, and... And the, uh, oh shit. Oh, what was it? It was the two archers, the ensign, and the pikemen. 
and that was that was a disgusting game. But yeah, Archers, one of the are they the only one that has uh yep. They're the only ones that have like a negative buff left, which I mean if you know war chest then you probably can tell that what four are left. Uh but yeah, I really don't think that that is that big of a deal. Um although it can be. So like again, that's why I've completely flipped on this game is because every unit is good. Every unit has a counter. Um, it's just trying to figure out which ones you're going to want to deal with. So no, my number five, the Archer. Then we get into my number four, which you might, you might be surprised as my number four, but there's kind of a, a small reason. And my number four is the Royal Guard, the Royal Guard. And I'm going to be completely honest, one of my least favorite things about this game is the fact that the Royal Coin sucks so much ass um, that the Royal Guard is up this high because it's the only unit that can actually use the Royal Coin for something other than a face down action. And its tactic is discard the Royal Coin to move the Royal Guard. That's not a lot. That's something that's like, that's it. But the fact that you don't, because at some point your royal coin just is going to be like nothing. It's like, well, I have initiative. Uh, I've recruited everything. Don't want to pass. So I guess I can't do anything. But if you have the royal guard, at least you can spend it to move it, you know, somewhere. You can do something with it. This becomes versatile in other ways. But the other reason that the royal guard is this high up is when the Royal Guard is attacked, you may remove a Royal Guard coin from the supply rather than from its unit. I do not see any reason ever why you would ever bolster the Royal Guard. Like, basically, it is a tower that is going to defend a position, and if you actually start maneuvering it to get in your opponent's way, then, I mean, this is also a good counter against the pikemen. Because there are five uh, Royal Guard units. If you attack the Pikemen... Actually, the, when uh, when the Royal Guard is attacked, never mind. <laughs> uh, I was like, man, yeah, okay, it counters the Pikemen. It doesn't. Um, but if the Pikemen attacks the Royal Guard for some reason, you get to actually remove it from the supply. So this one unit is effectively a bolstered five unit. Uh, because all you really need, because you start with two anyway, so, uh, in your bag. So you basically get your Royal Guard in position. Hell, you can even be super slow with it. You can just use your Royal Coin to slowly start moving your Royal Guard. And then once it's there, you use your other token to start activating it. Royal Coin to start moving it. And if your opponents want to start attacking it, it's like, okay, boom you kind of wasted an attack. Now, eventually, the Royal Guard will be out of units, and then it doesn't do anything, and you're back to having a lame-ass Royal Coin token. But the fact that you are effectively a walking bolstered unit is disgusting. And it has its own innate mobility. Hell, again, something really good with the Ensign, that the Ensign can kind of just move it, and you use the Royal Coin to move it again, so it gets double movement. You just make this thing get in the way of everything. And once it's on control points, you can actually use its own tokens to take control. And then you slowly move this tower around and you force your opponents to focus fire on it. And then eventually, yeah, you're not going to have any more in the supply. And then it starts actually getting removed from the board. But it already did its job. It's disgusting. I... Ugh, yeah, last game I had against it, it's like I don't have enough action or attack economy to to melt your Royal Guard enough. Uh, so it was just constantly there. And yeah, that's why it's up here. It's also way up here at number four because of the fact that it gets to use a... Uh, it gets to use the Royal Coin more than anything else. And I really wish that wasn't the case. So that is why the Royal Guard is at number four. 
My number three. I feel like might actually be... I feel like might be lower on some people's list. I don't know why, but I have made this unit a strategy and it has worked. I have just made them every single time I have them. They are almost my immediate go-to. And my number three is the Light Cavalry. Five units of this thing. And its ability is so simple, it's almost dumb. And it gets to move two spaces. And that is disgusting. Because if you look at the board, a lot of the control areas are within two spaces. So I have absolutely made it a point to recruit every single one of these units. And all I do is have them gallop around the board. You have one unit come out. Hell, I've even bolstered them before because you have five units. Why not? And then it's like, oh, going to activate. Boom, boom. Okay, my next turn. Going to activate. Take control. Okay, next turn. Boom, boom. All right, going to get these three tokens back. Going to use them. Control. Then move them. I mean, obviously, you don't get to go in a row. So this is a very unrealistic scenario. But the fact that you have that capability... If you have other units that can pull focus away from your light cavalry, they are going to run all over the map. And hell, even when your opponents are going to try to kill them, like uh, like if you have a unit here and they summon you know, an archer to try and take care of them, if you happen to have a light cavalry, then it's like, oh, okay, let's run away. And you, you don't feel, I mean, because a lot of times in, like, chess, you, and I know, like, professionals, I've, I've watched, like, videos of, like, grandmasters talking about strategy. Uh, they fully talk about how you, you pulling units back is a viable strategy because you almost don't want to. You almost want to keep putting the offensive. This game, it is totally viable to kind of retreat and reposition yourself. And... Honestly, like I've had it to where it's like, oh, okay, gonna gonna have the light cavalry move here. Oh, they summoned, uh, they some, you know, let's say the archer was right there to try and kill the archer. Oh, they summoned a whatever. They summoned a berserker. So, well, I don't want my light cavalry to lose, so I'm gonna, you know, retreat and just kind of you just keep them galloping around when you can activate them and just get. I mean, two spaces is insane because again one two one two one two one two one two almost everything is within two spaces there's very few that are not like from this one to this one you can't get to um from this one to this one you can't get to uh this one to this one like there are a few you can't get to just with the light cavalry but you kind of they're a massive diversion in in my opinion now, if you make your entire strategy hell-bent on maneuvering around and you don't recruit any other units and then your opponent is able to get the right draw to where they can start actually attacking and killing your light cavalry, well, then that, that sucks. Because you still need a token to be able to control with them um, or attack with them. But they, they're not hindered. They can control. They can attack. They have no detriment. They just have and insane agility and if this game was about killing units like wiping your opponent's forces off the map then i wouldn't say they're that good but because it's about controlling uh these control points yeah i think they're insanely insanely good uh and this is what i was waiting on i have had a game this was completely random and i even made the joke um i don't remember what the fourth unit was but I have had it to where I had the Light Cavalry, the Cavalry, and the Lancers all be randomly distributed to me. I don't remember what the fourth unit was, though. That Because, I mean, obviously there are only three horse units in the game. But the fact that I had all three horses, and it was just disgusting. I don't think the Lancers did shit that, that entire thing. But I know the Cavalry did, because they were my heavy attackers, and my Light Cavalry was my controllers. And they were disgusting. But I don't remember what the fourth one was. Maybe the Swordsman or something. But yeah, Light Cavalry at three. And honestly, I could have argued for them to be two. Um, 
But the number two is just so, like, so special, and it kind of gives me a little bit more of that that Magic the Gathering vibe, which they're not comparable at all, but it still kind of gives me that action efficiency. So my number two is the Warrior Priest. And the Warrior Priest has a very, very interesting ability. There are only four units of it, and it's after the Warrior Priest attacks or controls, you draw one coin from your bag and immediately use it to take any action. That is the equivalent of getting cards that let you draw from your deck in Magic the Gathering. If you're drawing, you're winning. And the Warrior Priest gives me that exact same vibe. Now, they do have to attack or control, but those are huge elements of the game. So if you are able to get them in the mix and get them to attack, you are getting more actions than your opponent. And getting you more actions could be if you drew three and you were like, damn it, I was really hoping to uh, draw into my archer and I didn't get it, but I know it's in my bag. Okay, then I'm going to do my best this round to potentially get my warrior priest to do something at least attack whether it's to sacrifice himself like you again that's a decent trade-off against a pikeman if a pikeman's there it's like i'm gonna have my warrior priest attack it's like okay he did attack that's gonna kill the pikeman and the warrior priest however i do still get to draw from my bag and uh, i have one token in my bag i know exactly what it is and it's my archer and you know, and that is the action that I need, and I get to immediately use it. It's not just draw, and you now have an extra token. You get to immediately use it, so you can kind of get two turns in a row with the Warrior Priest, and you're like, okay, boom, now I can actually attack, so you're before your Light Cavalry runs away. It is easily, like, in my opinion, the best action economy in the game, um... Again, if you can get them involved. That is the only negative, in my opinion, is if they aren't able to get into a position to be able to attack or control, then yeah, you're not getting that. But I feel like if you have the Warrior Priests in your arsenal, you should kind of be making it a point to be able to get them to do something. Whether that means you're not doing that a lot. I mean, hell, like this is a faction that super benefits from being bolstered. Because that means they're not going to be dwindled out as much. Like, I honestly wouldn't be opposed to doing a three bolster. And you're not using them a lot. But when you are using them, it's like, okay, I'm going to move them. When I draw this again, I'm going to be able to attack. Or I'm going to be able to control. Now I'm going to get to draw them again. And if you don't get to draw from your bag, you're going to get to replenish it. And hell, you might even get to draw your warrior priest token again to immediately use it again. And it's like, oh man, you had you had a scout there trying to interrupt my thing? Okay, well hey, I'm redrawing. Because I was able to, I controlled this area, gonna redraw. And oh look, it's my warrior priest again. I'm gonna kill your scout. Oh man, I get to draw again. And it's my lancer that I actually moved into a position to kill your unit. So I drew my, my lancer that I'm gonna use so he can actually go do something. When you are comboing... Uh, actions in a game that is effectively one turn after another uh, that's absolutely disgusting so you might be wondering why aren't they my number one and that's because my number one is the only faction faction the only unit that I actually don't see a counter to they're the only one uh, like I can theoretically see an argument, and there probably is. There's probably someone that's like, okay, that, that actually that unit actually sucks ass. Um, but it's the only card and the only unit that doesn't have an inherent, inherent negative, like a downside that I can think of. So my number one is the knight. And the knight's ability, because I, I was talking about how there are some factions that actually... Um, like the Berserker is a faction that actually utilizes a bolster ability. The Knight does, but it hinders your opponent. And it's the Knight can only be attacked by units that are bolstered. And that 
At least in the games that I have played, bolstering is not something that is done a lot. And that could just be a flaw, uh, you know, that's, you know, a newbie, um, you know, newbie move. <coughs> Die. <coughs> a newbie move. And that's entirely possible. Um, but like I said, uh, throughout this entire thing, it does. there's a lot of factions that don't benefit from being bolstered. Most do, but there are some that's like, well, there's not really a point. And the fact that the knight has doesn't also have to be bolstered, it can have one unit, and it could be surrounded by every single one of your opponent's forces. None of them are able to attack it um, because none of them are bolstered. And what that means is that to kill one of your knight's units, they would have to start bolstering, which takes an action, which means that if you go heavy in knights, you might have an action that allows you to attack. So it's like, oh, you're going to bolster them? Okay, I'm going to activate the knight to attack. That's going to kill your cavalry. Now it can't attack me again. And because you can't do anything with just one unit, the more your opponent bolsters, the less actions they're going to get with it. Yeah, their units are going to be on the board, but if your knights get in the fray, then they immediately become a hazard. Unlike the Royal Guard, that still is a tank moving around, because every time you attack it, it's still going to stay there. You're just removing its supply. The knight, I think, is even a, a, a more efficient tank, because... It isn't, it doesn't have to be bolstered. It actually benefits from being bolstered because that means your opponents are also going to have to bolster it and they're still not going to get rid of it because they have to attack it and now it's still there, giving you the opportunity to unbolster them. Um, and so when your opponents start losing forces left and right because they're trying to bolster and kill it, that means that now they might not have the action economy. Like, if you have a cavalry, like the, the cavalry that has four total uh, tokens, um, if you're starting to kill them and they have bolstered it, well, they actually can't activate it. So now they have a bolstered unit that is just dead weight. It's right there. It's bolstered, but it can't activate because you don't have a chip that allows you to actually use it. And honestly, I really cannot see a downside to the knight. It is, I mean, it's disgusting by itself. It, I mean, honestly, I feel like the knight should have like three units because of that very reason. Um, because it benefits from having uh, other units. I mean, mainly, again, the ensign and the, the, um, the marshal. Uh, like... Those are just insanely good support units. But if you're able to kind of get them involved, or hell, you have knights that can't be attacked, now your scouts are even more disgusting because they just pop in next to your knights. Or it's like, oh, you're moving a bolstered unit up on it. Okay, scout's going to pop in the way and now hinder you even more. I really cannot see a downside to the knight. Uh, now, as, it, as far as I'm aware, you are not able to unbolster units. <laughs> so if you were able to unbolster units, like if you like if you had two bolstered like swordsmen come in to attack the uh, the knight, for example, um, and like let's say they move there and then they did pop a scout and you could do an action to unbolster them and like put it back in your discard, then yeah, like they're not as you know, hindering to your opponent. But as far as I'm aware, you are not able to do that. So the fact that you have to be bolstered to attack the knight is disgusting. Now again, every unit has a counter. Like a bolstered archer and a bolstered crossbowman, that's a pretty good counter for the knight because he now he has to try and make his way to you. And if you can keep the knight at bay from your rangers, then uh, he is probably going to get get picked off. Um by that because they are bolstered and they have the range to attack. Like I said at the very beginning, every single unit has ways to counter it. I don't think that any faction, even at my number 16, is bad. It's more of how are you going to use them with the four that you got. But 
For my personal favorite, all the way up to number one with the Knight, uh, this is my ranking for the 16 factions in War Chest. Let's see if I can do something cool. Ha ha! That was trash. <laughs> but yeah, um, this was just something fun to do because uh, I have really been enamored with War Chest lately. I know it's an older game, but this is something fun. And it is not a short ranking video like I thought it was going to be. I tried to be really efficient. But that's it, everyone. Uh, let me know what you think of these factions. Let me know where you would rank all of these in the comments below. Um, and hell, let me know some strategies. If you think the Lancer is should not be at 16, I really want to hear about it. I think this is a game that has a ton of versatility. And there are going to be people who have played this way more than I have that can talk about how good some of the factions that I have or the units that I have that are lower and why maybe the the warrior priest is actually super bad. But that is, uh, that's my thoughts. There are three expansions uh, for the game. So if you like this ranking video, I can do a ranking video of all the expansion factions as well. I do plan on doing a review over each one of those, but uh, that's going to be more about what they actually bring to the game more so than their actual factions. But I can do a ranking on those. Um, and if you want to see it. But yeah, that is my ranking on the War Chest units. Let me know what uh, you think again in the comments below. Other than that, like, comment, share, and subscribe, and have a wonderful whatever time of day it is for you. Hey everyone, thank you for watching, and I really hope that you enjoyed the video. If you would like to see more of my content, go ahead and click that subscribe button and the bell to be notified whenever I upload any new content. If you feel like supporting the channel, you can go ahead and click that Patreon link to be taken to my Patreon, and any help is truly appreciated. Other than that, stick around for any, any other run-throughs or reviews or cool top tens or whatever I feel like putting on. Other than that, like, comment, share, and subscribe, and have a wonderful whatever time of day it is for you.